You're listening to the Future Composer Podcast, a show that empowers composers, musicians, and artists with knowledge. Now, here's your host, John Presley. My guest today is Will Bates. He's an award-winning composer who is consistently breaking new ground with innovative music and sound design. He's composed the music for the hit 2015 documentary, Going Clear, Scientology and the Prison of Belief, a film that was critically acclaimed for its brave approach towards a previously taboo subject matter. In addition to film scoring, Will has created the company Fall On Your Sword, a music and audio post-production studio located in Brooklyn, New York. Will, thank you so much for being a guest with us on the Future Composer Podcast and taking time to talk with us today. Sure thing, John. Thanks for having me. So let's get into a typical day in your life. You've obviously got your hands in a lot of different projects, but what's that perfect day of composing music like? If you got to choose, what would you be doing in the studio right now? I guess the, the perfect day for me is when everything just sort of seems to flow out of me correctly, if you know what I mean. I'm doing a lot of television at the moment, which means the deadlines are pretty tight. So I have a kind of pretty rigid schedule which actually really suits me because of my background. I I really love a a good deadline and kind of knowing where a certain project is going to live, if that makes sense. So I guess like really just getting in front of my rig, making sure that everything's kind of firing up correctly and just kind of having a really clear understanding of what I need to get done for the day. And, you know, I, I spend a lot of time at the beginning of a project really kind of feeling my way into you know, melodically and sonically how something is going to live. And I guess a lot of my my work is done in kind of preparation of that process. Like I kind of source instruments, find a kind of melodic idea for something. And I guess once I get into a routine when I'm composing, once I found all of those things, for me, the, the really fun part is 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 the the actual work part, like the day-to-day grind of like really getting through a project once I've kind of done the sort of scary part, which is like figuring out what the palette of a of a score is going to be like. Does that make sense? So I kind of, for me, it's really about the kind of ritual of getting in front of my gear and kind of getting going once I've stumbled on that palette. You talk about those tight deadlines for TV. I'm curious how you keep that balance in your life to meet those deadlines, but also create great music. I mean, I've always been fast that's something that I for better or for worse I always I become kind of like excited and almost impatient to get something down like to get something recorded and to kind of start to kick the ball around and even like creatively working with a director that's something that I'm always really keen to to get going as quickly as possible once I've read something or once I've seen a cut I always just want to dive straight in and really I I guess like I tend to when I'm coming up with my ideas and my approach, I tend to get things produced to a pretty high standard in my first round. Because sound is such an important inspiration for me as well as melody, I, I guess the two kind of go hand in hand. So in a way that really helps to have the process go pretty quickly. So in terms of the deadline, you know, I mean, I, I come from a background of scoring commercials, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a bit, but um, that really helped me like dial things really quickly. So for television, that really, that really helps as well to kind of have that, that sense of deadline. But I think because I'm always like striving to have something produced to a pretty high level early on, I guess like creatively, that's part of my process. So I, I always feel like the two kind of go hand in hand. So let's go back. I know you play several instruments and as a musician, you've spanned genres from jazz to techno, probably everything in between. Tell me about your musical training, the hours of practice, and how you really developed as a musician. Since I was a kid, I've kind of always wanted to score movies. That was like my first thing. I I sort of discovered a love of, of music within the context of film. I think I was like six years old and sang the whole score of Star Wars to my parents and... <laughs> They uh, went out and bought me a violin, which I then tortured them with for about five years. No, maybe longer, actually, maybe like <laughs> 10 years. The, the violin never really connected with me. It was too bloody difficult. Um, but I guess by the time I was about nine, I discovered the saxophone and I discovered jazz. And I really wanted to, to 
become a jazz musician. That was like my thing until I was about 16 or 17 and I was very dedicated and, you know, practiced a lot, got really good, was very good at a very young age. I was like playing in cafes and bars and stuff when I was like 15 or 16, masquerading as an 18 year old. And, you know, that was that was kind of the early part of me understanding what it takes to be a musician, to be dedicated and to be driven. Um, I think by the time I was like 19 or 20, I was maybe a little disillusioned by that whole process of being a like a session player, like being a, a jazz musician in London. It's it's pretty cutthroat and competitive. And I guess like it. It, being in that world made me much more of a, aware of like the competition and it became less creative somehow. And I, I started to get more love out of composing and producing and I discovered techno and started doing a lot of dance records. I, I was on a couple of labels out in London, Milk and Two Sugars and Federation and some of my kind of jazz roots like became... I don't know, a little bit intertwined with some of the dance stuff that I was doing. It was the 90s. It was back when you could, like, fuse jazz with drum and bass and it wouldn't be a total bummer like it kind of is now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, that was that became, like, more creatively fulfilling for me, I think, than just sort of trying to be the best player and, like, trying to be as fast on my instrument as possible. That just sort of... I guess I kind of left the idea of being just a, a saxophone player and like really embraced production and composition as something that was like more exciting to me and a little bit more, um, I guess you can be a bit more adaptable in that world and, and it's not quite as, it's not like, I don't know, you're just stuck on one path, if that makes sense. So when you sit down to compose today, what are some of those elements that you're still pulling from, from your musical background? You said, you know, maybe there's some no-nos of, of certain fusions of sounds that you're not doing anymore, but obviously as a musician, you sit down, you've got to create. What are just some of those basic raw things that you still pull from when you write? Totally. Um, you know, I guess like because of my background, I think that in the end, you know, for better or for worse, jazz is still a, a fantastic foundation for any kind of musical education I don't you know I'm not an amazing jazz pianist or anything like that but I think a lot of the harmony that I learned as a sax player just in a sort of in a very basic sense it comes from that from that education and I think that kind of what I learned from that was really just sort of a sense of harmony and you know kind of getting around a piano or getting around a guitar I think like probably comes from that background of like learning an instrument through improvisation I guess that's an important thing like the idea of like improvising is something that I definitely bring to my work and I definitely haven't really I mean I guess some of my scores have been somewhat jazz influenced but I I don't really bring that to the table these days as a composer but I do think that the way that I come up with things can be there is a foundation of looking at the instrument through experimentation, you know? Right. That's great. So a lot of our listeners have probably heard your work on Going Clear, the recent documentary about Scientology that was directed by Alex Gibney. It's really a fantastic film, and it was great because it was unafraid of going after a controversial subject matter, and it had a fantastic score as well. When it comes to collaborating with Alex, what made you a great teammate? I think that he um, he's really focused on music for one thing. Like the first movie that we did together was called We Still Secrets, and that was very much that was just a, a brilliant introduction to the way that he works. And I feel like he the great thing about his movies is that they're so cinematic, and he has this kind of narrative approach to his storytelling. It's not just sort of a, a bombardment of information. It's like a real cinematic journey and he really encouraged me to kind of bring that to it with the score and you know when we did going clear he really wanted it to be I think he talked about uh, mindscapes creating these kind of like ethereal atmospheric sort of mindscapes that would certainly be kind of influenced by the sci-fi aspect of of the of Scientology but also kind of really get into the emotional meaning of what it is to believe that stuff. So I think that he, his respect for the craft as well is, is really important. 
he understands what it what it takes in a way like not every filmmaker can d- does necessarily have that kind of connection with music and really understand what kind of goes into it and we have very long kind of preparatory discussions of, before kind of embarking on a project and he's always got some kind of brilliant idea that will be like the springboard for me to kind of go off and do my thing so i i think he, he's just a fantastic person to work with and it seems like you really enjoy the challenge of scoring documentaries and it seems like a lot of the more successful documentaries right now have that more narrative approach they're not just talking heads with a lot of information they're trying to take you somewhere they're trying to build an atmosphere and the music and sound design is a huge part of that i think in the past a lot of documentaries were just great in providing information but they're really vanilla in how they're presenting it but his work yeah. and what you're able to bring to it with the score are borrowing things from you know the traditional film world and i think that's great yeah do you see that continuing definitely yeah i i mean it's i i'm sure that i'll continue to work with alex and other documentarians but you know i i guess like for me the thing that is exciting about it is that rather than like you say it's not just kind of wallpaper music it's kind of treating it like a narrative so and you know that that also goes well with my i tend to kind of like different projects different kind of creative challenges and keeping everything balanced like that is important let's talk about the most recent project you've scored the path which is a new series on hulu it's a fictional story of a family man who joins a cult and kind of the dramatic twists and turns that come with really strong beliefs Tell us what was involved in the score for this series and what were you able to bring to the story? This is a really interesting project. I, I, I read the script and I kind of never really read anything quite like it. It was actually introduced to me by the director of the pilot, Mike Cahill. He and I have done a lot of work together in the past. He's just a, a real pleasure to collaborate with. Yeah, this script was just really crazy and interesting. And I met the showrunners and we really hit it off. And it became very clear on our kind of first meeting and our first kind of discussions that the music was going to have quite a a very prominent role, I guess. It's not really underscore exactly. They, the, the music that they wanted really had to kind of make a, a huge impact. And I think that that was really compelling to me that they weren't afraid to have the music be very bold and that's also something that Cahill is the role of music in his movies tends to kind of do that it it tends to be at the forefront which I of course as a composer I love that Um, but we talked about you know the sort of blending of unusual experimental electronic instruments with conventional instrumentation and kind of you know really getting to the heart of what these people are going through, why they believe in it. I mean, it's funny that I had just come off doing Going Clear. Honestly, it's a total coincidence. I'm not like the cult guy. (laughs) Um, But, you know, it was definitely, it it was helpful in a way to have that insight, having done that movie with Alex and then kind of go into this sort of fictional version of a similar kind of story. The belief system in this show is, it's pretty different to the Scientology belief system i mean i don't want to kind of give anything away i think when you see this show you'll understand what i mean but you know sonically it's it's really it's pretty out there i am um, went and got very deep into the rabbit hole of of uh, modular synthesis it's something that i hadn't really got into before and got myself a rig that's now basically the path rig and there's a lot of that stuff there's a lot of and kind of drawing from my background as a woodwind player there's a lot of bass clarinet in it we talked about there being strings in the score, but nothing too thick. So there's like one viola and one cello, like no vibrato, simple harmonies, just everything is very kind of raw and visceral and, and also very melodic. So yeah, it's a, it's a really fun one. Very excited about it. Let's talk about this movement towards online content, online streaming, doing a series for Hulu that's going to be on Hulu as production and budgets move, not necessarily away, but things are changing. Things are very dynamic between television, streaming, people cutting the cord, budgets moving towards some of these streaming services. How exciting is that for you? How scary is that for you? What does that mean for you as a composer? I feel like it's a real, it's a really exciting time right now. It seems like a bit of a golden age in the in the age of television production. And I guess like it's a lot of, a lot of these networks seem to be able to take 
some risks. You know, they when they're the ones that are putting out the content, I guess they they obviously get very involved in creating it themselves. And you know, I, for us, it just felt like with the Hulu show, we were given real creative freedom. And one of the great things about Jason Katims, the showrunner, he's a he's amazing at putting together these incredible creative teams. And I I think that there was a lot of mutual respect amongst everyone that was making the show and particularly in the in the sound department we were all really just kind of allowed to kind of really go for it and I think that the fact that Hulu was involved had a huge part of that they really allowed creative freedom and expression and I think that maybe that's that's something that's happening right now obviously there's a lot of content being made you got to work a little harder to to cut through the noise I guess but, you know, the fact that there's as much content being created as there is, I think it's a, a great time for a composer as well because there's a real need for, for music right now. So in addition to all the film work, all the television work that you've done, you've also worked on many commercials for a lot of top brands like Google, Coke, Nike, many, many more. Tell us about the process of scoring commercials, the quick turnarounds, the creative briefs winning the job what can you share about your experience scoring commercials well you know it's funny i kind of i got into scoring commercials because i rather naively thought that that would be a route into scoring films um and i started out as being a a staff composer at another music production company and i left there and started my own my own shop you know the, those two worlds exist kind of in parallel they don't, they tend not to intersect too much um advertising in movies but as I feel like as the world has evolved, the two are kind of beginning to kind of coalesce a little bit more. You know, sometimes when a when a director finishes his or her movie, they'll go off and do a, a commercial and, and generally take us with them. But, um, you know, I guess in a sort of day-to-day sense, scoring a commercial is, I you know, we've had situations where we'll get a brief and we'll have a week to do it. Or someone will call up in the morning and we'll need to have something ready by the afternoon. It really, it's pretty hardcore and it's extremely competitive. And, you know, you have to kind of be prepared to kill your babies a little bit. Like sometimes you'll write something for, you know, for a night straight and you'll realize that you're being submitted along with 20 other pieces of music. It's just kind of how it is. But I, it's like a lot of this stuff. It tends to be a numbers game sometimes unfortunately it's not always to do with the quality of the work but I think that the longer that you do this stuff and the more that we've been involved in this world and kind of developed a a brand and a a name it's become a little easier because people kind of come to us for a certain thing and expect a certain quality of work so you know we've been doing this for a while so it's got to the point where fall on your sword operates doing the commercials and then I generally do the TV shows and the movies as a sort of separate thing. But yeah, you know, they I, I have to say that my training as a commercial composer really was kind of instrumental in, in everything that I've done and I, I try to keep the same level of creativity to everything that I do. Let's talk about that brand you've created, Fall on Your Sword. Tell us about the studio that you have in Brooklyn. I've seen the pictures online. It looks beautiful. It seems like you've got everything you need to, to compose something, to do post-production, sound design. What types of hardware, software, people, and setup do you have there? Well, we, we really began as primarily a, just a music production facility. It really began as a place for me to do my work. So that was kind of the genesis of the whole place. And as we have grown both in size and uh, and you know, in working in different facets of the industry. We've kind of grown into audio post as well as music and sound design. And we, we have a kind of one-stop shop facility now. Music production as well as mix and sound design and Foley. The idea being that, initially the idea being that an independent film or any kind of project would have their score done and then we would also do the whole sound package for them as well. And we also create a lot of art. My uh, My wife is a painter and this really began as kind of an excuse for us to work together but we uh we create these kind of audio visual installations and there's also a workshop that's attached to the rest of the company and we 
we build these experiential pieces and through our connections in advertising, we've started to get into that as well. Um, so it's really just a it, fall on your sword kind of began as like a video art project with YouTube videos and crazy mashup things and a band. And really in the end, it has become this umbrella for all the different audio visual things that we like to do. So it's like a safe place for me to kind of experiment and all the, all the madness. Right. Well, I looked online at some of the sound installations that you have for some of these different companies and really some unique ideas. I saw you playing with like wind and creating instruments and things out of Pringle cans and <laughs> all sorts of crazy stuff yeah, that could man. really, could be, could be cheesy. But when you watch the videos, it's, it's really creative stuff. It, it borders on art. It is art. Um, so I have a lot of respect for that. And it seems like that's a growing demand for you. Yeah, it definitely is. You know, it, it really began because we were doing a lot of art shows in New York and building these pieces for actually for a specific fair called Spring Break, which happens every year during the Armory Art Week in New York. And we were building these pieces for that show. And a lot of a lot of people that were in the world of advertising just saw these pieces and were like, this is ridiculous. We need to try and harness this for a particular brand so we we kind of brought the same aesthetic to you know to some of the advertisers that were interested in that stuff and I feel like you know everything has a background in music and and the relationship between music and and video and also nothing really takes itself too seriously everything's kind of done with a little bit of a wink so yeah it's really and it you know with a lot of advertisers it seems to be kind of a growing medium people really want to get into this world of like making stuff that can kind of exist as a as a viral marketing campaign as well as a piece of art. Let's talk about the balance of creativity versus stress. There's a lot of work that goes into the business side of composing, but you have to focus on making great music as well. Tell us about your daily habits, routines, what kind of habits have helped you to make yourself a better artist and how you walk that tightrope. Well, I have a great team. Um, my business partner, Lucy Alper, is my sort of day-to-day -day producer. She kind of runs everything at Fall on Your Sword. I have a great assistant. We have a whole team of producers who work on the audio post side of things. You know, I, my day-to-day my -day is like waking up in the morning and talking to Lucy about what's, um, what's coming down the pipe for the day. And, you know, she's really good at kind of balancing everything for me. And when I need to have things cleared out and I just need to focus on on writing she kind of knows exactly how to steer everything to the side and take control of situations so that I can just kind of get down to work because it really is like I have to be pretty focused you know I mean there's a lot of distraction I guess running a business as well so for me like having that team there is absolutely essential to kind of being able to focus on creating good work and just, you know, generally like picking projects that I know I'm going to get excited about. There's nothing worse than trying to sort of bang your head against the wall, doing something that your heart and soul aren't really into. Like I, I think that I've kind of been doing this long enough to fortunately be able to pick and choose my projects now. And I think that's, that's really important to, that's like half the battle. If you're actually really fully invested in something and you're excited about it, it makes it a whole lot easier to to kind of dive in and give it your best shot. Definitely. So as we start to wrap up, what are your plans for the future and what type of projects are you looking to work on and why? Well, I'm really enjoying the, the television stuff. That's, you know, this is kind of a new thing for me. And there are a couple other shows on the horizon, which is very exciting. But, you know, I'm, I, it's been a little while since I did a narrative um, and I'm actually halfway through one at the moment, which is lovely to kind of be back in that world. I'm doing a movie called Imperium, um, which stars Daniel Radcliffe as an undercover FBI agent. So that's been kind of thrilling. And I, I have a couple of other narratives on the horizon. There's always like, you know, there's always 10 things coming down the pipe. It's always kind of hard to figure out what the first thing is going to be. But um, yeah, you know, keeping everything varied, I think that's that's the most important thing for me. And meanwhile, you know, I have a have a one-year-old son, so that keeps me pretty occupied. Definitely. I do as well. So. Oh, you do? Right on. Yeah. So you know. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. 
So the last question, give us some parting advice for composers, musicians, singers, any artists who wants to build a career in music. Um, I think, God, that's always such a hard question. So generic, know? but I know that you have some, some great advice that's in there that wraps it up. Let's see. I guess for me, the most important thing, the thing that's taken me a little bit of a while to learn has been finding the voice, you know, of trying to figure out what it is that kind of sets me apart from other people and, you know, figuring out what that thing is, is basically the same process as figuring out what it is that makes you excited about creating. Um, I think the sooner that you can understand what it is that makes you really want to do this, the easier everything else tends to be. It also gives people an easier job when they're trying to hire you for a gig, like rather than being adequate a million things, finding one thing to really kind of focus your attention on seems to be pretty important. That's great advice. So, well, thank you so much for being a guest with us today. I really, really appreciate the insight you've given us and we really look forward to hearing more great music from you in the future. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Future Composer Podcast. For more podcast episodes and in-depth articles, visit futurecomposer.com. To learn more about our host, visit johnpresleymusic.com.